When I did my video on Daniel 8, I stated that it's the most difficult chapter I've had to deal with so far. Well, now it's been surpassed by Daniel 11. In doing my research into this chapter, I've come to realize that my expectations of what this chapter was talking about was way off. I was under the impression that it was mostly about the end times still in our future. I no longer believe that. The biggest challenge of this chapter seems to be figuring out where the division is between already fulfilled prophecies and the future end times prophecies. In researching this, I've now come to believe that most of this chapter has already been fulfilled during the Greek Empire. The trick is figuring out at what point it jumps to eschatology. I used to think that division was between verses 5 and 6. Now I believe it's either between verses 35 and 36 or 39 and 40. And even that belief might not be right either. Verse 6 is going to mention the end of years. And that, of course, made me think that verse 6 to the end was all eschatology. But I also decided to consider the possibility that it's still talking about the Greek Empire because the King of the South, a central figure in this vision, is mentioned in verse 5 before the phrase, the end of years, was used. So I decided to search Google and YouTube for Daniel 11 Fulfilled. I found several websites and videos all teaching the same basic thing that for some weird reason I'd never really heard before. So this is not a new teaching that I'm dreaming up on my own here. Apparently, it was only new to me. <laughs> when I had heard it said that Daniel successfully predicted in great detail the future of Greece, I thought they were only talking about Daniel 8. Well, it turns out that this chapter is amazingly precise on how it predicted the events of the Greek Empire. The problem was that I didn't know the history of the Greek Empire yet. Also, I, in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I, stood to confirm and to strengthen him. This is important to understand about the chronology of this book. This first verse in chapter 11 is a direct continuation out of chapter 10. It is still Gabriel speaking. Gabriel is saying that back in the first year of Darius, the same year that Daniel 9 was given, by the way, he stood to confirm and to strengthen him. Him who? Darius? Michael? Daniel? I think it must mean Darius because of the context of the next verses. That would mean that Gabriel sometimes fights the world powers and sometimes strengthens them. It's interesting what we don't get to see behind the spiritual veil, isn't it? And now will I show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grisha. This is a single verse summary of the entire Persian Empire leading to the Greek Empire. And a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. This is talking about Alexander the Great of the Greek Empire. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven and not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others beside those. This is describing what happened to the Greek Empire after Alexander the Great died. Succession of kings usually stays in the family, but not this time. This prophecy predicted the unusual occurrence of four of Alexander's generals splitting up the empire. And the king of the south shall be strong, and one of his princes, and he shall be strong above him, and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion. So now the real fun begins. Who is the king of the south? It's the king of Egypt, Ptolemy I. We'll meet the king of the north in the next verse. This is still talking about the Greek Empire, the southernmost 
of the four Greek partitions became very powerful as well as the northern one. It's like the four Greek partitions went down to only two. The era of the first Syrian war is being described here. And in the end of years, they shall join themselves together, for the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement, but she shall not retain the power of the arm, neither shall he stand, nor his arm, but she shall be given up, and they that brought her, and he that begot her, and he that strengthened her in these times. This was the end part of the Second Syrian War. Ptolemy II, the king of the south, sent his daughter, Berenice, to Antiochus II, the king of the north, so their marriage would bring peace between the north and south. It didn't work. Antiochus II, Berenice, and their son were all murdered by Antiochus II's ex-wife. But out of a branch of her roots shall one stand up in his estate, which shall come with an army, and shall enter into the fortress of the king of the north, and shall deal against them, and shall prevail, and shall also carry captives into Egypt their gods, with their princes, and with their precious vessels of silver and of gold, and he shall continue more years than the king of the north. So the king of the south shall come into his kingdom, and shall return into his own land. This was the third Syrian war. Ptolemy III, brother of the murdered Berenice, invaded the north victoriously. He recovered a bunch of statues and other valuables and brought it all back to Egypt. He then outlived the king of the north by a few years. But his sons shall be stirred up and shall assemble a multitude of great forces. And one shall certainly come and overflow, and pass through. Then shall he return, and be stirred up, even to his fortress. And the king of the south shall be moved with choler, and shall come forth and fight with him, even with the king of the north. And he shall set forth a great multitude, but the multitude shall be given into his hand. And when he hath taken away the multitude, his heart shall be lifted up, and he shall cast down many ten thousands, but he shall not be strengthened by it. This was the fourth Syrian war. Antiochus III tried to invade the south, but Ptolemy IV was able to defeat him despite being outnumbered. But afterwards, both of them were very weakened. But the king of the north shall return, and shall set forth a multitude greater than the former, and shall certainly come after certain years with a great army and with much riches. And in those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall. So the king of the north shall come, and cast up a mount, and take the most fenced cities, and the arms of the south shall not withstand, neither his chosen people, neither shall there be any strength to withstand. But he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will, and none shall stand before him. And he shall stand in the glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed. This was the fifth Syrian war. Antiochus III returned years later with an even larger army, and eventually took over the land of Israel. He shall also set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom and upright ones with him. Thus shall he do, and he shall give him the daughter of women corrupting her, but she shall not stand on his side, neither before him. Antiochus III gave his daughter, Cleopatra, to Ptolemy V for a wife. She ended up siding with Ptolemy instead of her dad. After this shall he turn his face unto the isles, and shall take many, but a prince for his own behalf shall cause the reproach offered by him to cease. Without his own reproach, he shall cause it to turn upon him. Then he shall turn his face toward the fort of his own land. 
but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. Antiochus the third tried to take more lands against the will of the Romans. He also alienated his former ally, Macedonian king Philip V. He was eventually killed in his own land while trying to plunder a pagan temple. Then shall stand up in his estate a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom. But within few days he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle. Antiochus the third's son, Seleucus the fourth, became king and raised taxes because Rome was forcing them to pay for Antiochus the third's wars. He was soon poisoned to death. And in his estate shall stand up a vile person, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Antiochus IV became king through a series of events that included flattering the king of Pergamum to get his support and the death of the rightful heir to the throne. And with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him, and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. The high priest, or the prince of the covenant, was replaced through a conspiracy between the high priest's brother and Antiochus Epiphanes. But the brother was eventually double-crossed when yet another priest bribed Antiochus Epiphanes with even more money. And after the league made with him he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. Antiochus Epiphanes still wanted to conquer Egypt. He took a small army down to Egypt, pretending to be the protector of Ptolemy VI, who was his nephew. He was pretending to be allied with Egypt, but it was all part of his plan to eventually conquer Egypt. He shall enter peaceably, even upon the fattest places of the province, and he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey, and spoil, and riches, yea, and he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds, even for a time. Antiochus Epiphanes went into the richest parts of Egypt, and gained their loyalty by spreading the wealth of his war campaigns to the public. He also visited the Egyptian strongholds that he was planning on conquering, so he could figure out how to defeat them. And he shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army. And the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army. But he shall not stand, for they shall forecast devices against him. Yea, they that feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him, and his army shall overflow, and many shall fall down slain. And now we come to the sixth and final Syrian war between Antiochus Epiphanes and Ptolemy the Sixth. Antiochus Epiphanes eventually attacked Egypt and prevailed. Many of the Egyptians were corrupted by Antiochus Epiphanes and betrayed Ptolemy the Sixth. And both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief, and they shall speak lies at one table, but it shall not prosper. For yet the end shall be at the time appointed. The political intrigue was running rampant with Antiochus Epiphanes and Ptolemy VI being related to each other, yet supposed enemies. Antiochus Epiphanes pretended to be his friend and concerned for his interests, but all he was doing was pitting him against his brother Ptolemy VII who was made king of Egypt by the Alexandrians, who didn't trust Ptolemy VI anymore. Then shall he return into his land with great riches, and his heart shall be against the Holy Covenant, and he shall do exploits, and return to his own land. Antiochus Epiphanes returned north because of a rumor of his death had caused a war to erupt in Jerusalem, he killed a lot of people and plundered the temple, and then went back north to Antioch. At the time appointed he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. 
for the ships of Shittim shall come against him. Therefore he shall be grieved, and return, and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. Antiochus Epiphanes eventually returned to Egypt intent on taking Alexandria. But the Egyptians called on the Romans for help. Three Roman senators were sent by ship to demand that Antiochus Epiphanes retreat from his attempt to take Egypt. He reluctantly agreed and returned to Jerusalem. He killed the believing Jews, but not the Hellenistic Jews, the Jews who forsake the Holy Covenant. And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. Antiochus Epiphanes desecrated the temple, stopped the daily sacrifices, built a pagan altar to Zeus in the temple, and sacrificed pigs on it. Putting a statue of Zeus directly inside God's temple was a direct offense to the commandments of God. It was another god before him, and it was a graven image. It was clearly an abomination, and it made the temple desolate while it was in there. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity, and by spoil many days. This obviously caused a lot of turmoil within the Jewish people. Antiochus Epiphanes was able to convince many to forsake God and his law, while others were not and did what they could to stay true to God's word. Many lost their lives being loyal to God. These Jews were just as much martyrs even before the cross as any Christian martyr after the cross. Now when they shall fall, they shall be helped with a little help. But many shall cleave to them with flatteries, and some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white even to the time of the end because it is yet for a time appointed. This all gets into the time known as the Maccabean Revolt and afterwards. But here's where it starts getting fuzzy. Nobody seems to know for sure what the following verses are talking about in regards to ancient history. It seems to me that the mentioning of the time of the end here provides the probable end time gap we're looking for. It's saying that the persecution of believers will continue on from the time of Antiochus Epiphanes all the way to today and tomorrow. This now fast forwards us to the end times. So keep in mind, now that we're dealing with the future, we won't really know until after these verses are fulfilled. And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself, and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that that is determined shall be done. Which king are we talking about here? It doesn't say north or south here. The Sixth Syrian War ended with Rome coming between Greece and Egypt and stopping Antiochus Epiphanes for the last time. Then Rome eventually conquered both Greece and Egypt. I think this king must be the Antichrist, the king of the end times revived Roman Empire. The four beasts, Babylon, Persia, Greece with four heads, and Rome, have all come together to become the seven-headed beast in Revelation 13. This king is the king of them all. This guy is going to think he's so great and Christians are so bad. 
Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. This could mean he will be an atheist, a secular humanist, a Darwinist, but it could also mean he rejected the faith of his family. And this could also be saying he's gay, too. This man literally thinks he's God. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many, and shall divide the land for gain. This guy rules by military force. The strange God could be a new religion that could come from a fake event like an alien invasion or whatever. Dividing the land could be talking about the land of Israel or the entire globe into global regions. At the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots, and with horsemen, and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries, and shall overflow and pass over. The king of the south will push at him, the king of the north. So I think this is saying the king, back in verse 36, is the king of the north. And the king of the north was the Syrian part of the Greek empire, which eventually became part of the Roman Empire. So who is the king of the south then? It was the Egyptian part of the Greek Empire, which also became part of the Roman Empire. This may be related to the feet of iron and clay from Daniel 2. Based on what we've seen recently, I could easily speculate that the north are the United Nations and the south are the Arab Nations. But that would only be speculation, and I can't be dogmatic about that yet. We might be seeing the South in the form of ISIS pushing at the North, causing the North to fight against ISIS. He shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. The country of Jordan seems to be the safe haven described here. Maybe that's where we should all move to. Maybe not. The he being described here is probably the king of the north still who's fighting against the south. He enters into Israel and overthrows many countries. Maybe Jordan is just where the southern forces flee to. Who knows? We shall see. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. So it sounds like the north will successfully take control of all the countries bordering the Mediterranean Sea. It does mention ships back in verse 40. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy, and utterly to make away many. The east could be China, and the north could be Russia. That would make sense, but we'll see. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. This final verse in this chapter is very mysterious to me. The glorious holy mountain is definitely Jerusalem based on the other uses of the phrase holy mountain in Scripture. But what does between the seas mean? It sounds to me like the king of the north will build the tabernacles of his palace in Jerusalem. This could very well be the rebuilding of a third temple or it could be some other kind of building. We'll see. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. 
and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars for ever and ever. Michael has been withholding the Antichrist. Second Thessalonians 2, verses 3-10 through 10, tells the story of how Paul explained this to the Thessalonians, but he doesn't write it down on paper for us. So this is when Michael stands up and the Antichrist is then revealed, which brings us into the three and a half year greatest tribulation, which is described here in the same way Jesus described it when he said, such as not was since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And at the end of that greatest tribulation, everyone written in the book gets resurrected and gathered, and we shine brightly in new spiritual bodies for eternity. Are you written in that book? Well, then that would make you one of Daniel's people, according to the verse. Daniel's people, as mentioned also in Daniel 9, are fellow believers, not unbelieving bloodline Hebrews. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. That was the end of the vision. It spanned from Daniel's old age during the beginning of the Persian Empire all the way to the end, including both resurrections and our future eternity. It focused on what the beast system would do throughout that world time. But it was written in a way that could not be easily understood until the time of the end after it was mostly fulfilled. Humanity has certainly gained a lot of knowledge since Daniel's day. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two, the one on this side of the bank of the river, and the other on that side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth for ever that it shall be for a time, times, and an half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. Here's one of the two uses of the phrase time, times, and a half. The other one is in Revelation 12:14, describing the woman hiding in the wilderness from Satan. I believe that time frame is talking about the three and a half year greatest tribulation. So this passage probably is too. But I'm curious about another possibility. We are assuming that a time is a year. And it may be a year in Revelation 12, 14, but that doesn't automatically mean it has to also be a year in this verse. It could just be a pattern. It says that all these things shall be finished, which would include both resurrections mentioned in verse 2. That would mean the millennium is chronologically part of this prophecy. The time frame between the Persian Empire all the way to the end of the millennium would be approximately 3,500 years. That could be three and a half millennia. And I could be falsely speculating, too. <laughs> we'll see. And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. 
Daniel couldn't understand it all, and we still can't today. He's told it all concerns the future and won't be understood until then. He's also told the future of Christian martyrdom and the blindness of the wicked that will continue until the end. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. When Jesus talked about the abomination of desolation, he must have been talking about this particular verse. Daniel 11.31 had already been fulfilled, but Jesus spoke of the abomination of desolation as a yet future event. So it seems that this prophecy of 1290 days has to be still in our future. Instead of linking this prophecy to Daniel 11.31, I think it might be linked to the building of the tabernacles of his palace in Daniel 11.45 where the Antichrist is revealed when Michael stands up in Daniel 12.1, beginning the three-and-a-half-year Greatest Tribulation. Blessed is he that waiteth, and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. There's an extra thirty days in the previous verse, and now there's an extra forty-five days in this verse. I suspect there may be a 30-day window before the Greatest Tribulation actually begins. We may see the Abomination of Desolation, which could be the building of the tabernacles of his palace, and then have 30 days before it actually begins. This may be the time when the woman flies into the wilderness, but the extra 45 days still baffles me. Do they come after the Greatest Tribulation somehow? I'm expecting the Day of the Lord to be a single day, not 45 days. So maybe the 45 days are also before the Greatest Tribulation. We'll see. But go thou thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. Daniel is told he'd eventually die, but also be resurrected at the end. I hope I get to ask him some questions after the Lord returns. I might have enough questions for the resurrected prophets to last the entire millennium. <laughs>